with all the words that have already been spoken today, let's just have a moment of praying in silence. And maybe you could let your thoughts drift to something that you thought was an important thing that's already happened this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and pleasing to you. Amen. It's interesting when you think about trying to start a message with a little silence or any kind of way that you've experienced silence this morning, because if I'm going to be honest, what I've observed in the world is we all hate silence. Silence can drive people, you know, un, you get nervous when you go out, people. If you ever walk, go to a bus place or somewhere, you know, a very common public place, it's very easy to find some people that are, might be feeling nervous in the environment because they need to strike up small talk. And I always kind of wonder, what is that dynamic? Why, why is it that silence or quiet makes us feel nervous? There are good ways to use silence. You can look at like some of the stories we see on certain movies where you have storytellers and movie creators that are using silence in effective ways. I always think of like a big space battle where you have this loud thing happening, but it's in the silence of space. And so then in the space battle, all of a sudden they'll cut and everything's cut off. And you just hear it's this eerie thing. It almost adds to the intensity it's like someone crying deep in the, in the background. <laughs> it adds to the intensity of what's happening. There was one movie I saw not too long ago that I just loved it. Now, I am not a suspense horror movie person, but has anyone heard of the movie A Quiet Place? Maybe a few nods, maybe a little bit. I'll tell you the basic premise of the movie because it's one of these post-apocalyptic movies. But the reason is, is no, everybody is, is quiet in this world. It's because... If we could just show a picture, you got John Krasinski right here. The reason everyone's quiet is because there's this alien that's landed on the world. And the second it hears any kind of sound, that alien just jumps at anything that, com that comes out. So they've created this world where they live in quiet. All the kids in the world, if there are kids, have felt toys that are so soft. And so the whole movie has lots of silence in it. It's this intense movie. Still... You can find good ways to use silence, but why don't we like it? What's the core of it? When I was in college, I, I could have done a picture. I didn't have a picture of this this morning. I, I, when I was in college, I, had a lot, I have a lot of unique stories, let's put it this way, what, about what happened to my college car. I had a very a, a car with lots of personality, let's say. A, a car with lots of personality. And in this car, um, I had it broken into a bunch of times. At one point in time, someone chucked something in the front wind, windshield and it all shattered everywhere. One of the things that happened was that my car stereo was stolen. So it was ripped out, which messed with the electrical system. I only found that out later. But it was ripped out, and I decided in my resourcefulness, I'm not going to replace it. So I, all of a sudden, here I am driving around and I'm just going to, I'm going to embrace the silence in my early twenties. It's like, this is going to be the way I live. And at first it's not bad. You know, you're driving around, you go do your errands, go get groceries. Not bad. You feel it when you do a road trip. I'll tell you that. But doing this, like you, you I started to think way back then that there's something about silence that's counter to the way this world is shaped. It's counter to what our longings are. I think about silence, and the truth is that silence, it stirs us towards the deeper questions, and maybe we don't really want to go there yet. It's these deeper questions. It's easy to be loud or put a microphone in front of me. It's easy for me to be loud, but it's far harder to be silent. We feel the pressure when that silence comes. We feel this need, this nervous tick to fill the void of silence. And it's almost like we perceive that if we don't try to fill the silence, we might be consumed by it. Or worse, our anxieties creeping up in the midst of it might just take over. There are 
These reasons why in the midst of the busyness of life, we're trying to do everything we can to not be silent, but it's stopping us from listening. Silence is hard. We'd prefer to be distracted, entertained, but we'll do whatever it takes to conceal our deep need for help. And for that, we have to avoid listening. My key question this morning, as we look in Luke 1, in the story with Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, is how can silence be a gift for my story, for your story? How can silence be a gift? And yeah, you're going to have to go there with me and think, why are, am I trying to avoid silence in certain ways? And what are ways that I'm willing for silence to be okay in my life? Because like those movie makers I just talked about, or my college version self, trying to do silence in my car on a road trip. You know, God is using silence to tell a good story, and he does it in this one. So in the context of our passage, we're not in the Old Testament anymore. We're in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in Luke. And just to catch us up a little bit to where we are in the story of Scripture, we have to look at God's people and where they are as stuck in silence. There was this moment that was predicted in this time. The last, if you actually went back a couple books, you'd go to Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. And the very last few verses of Malachi Malachi read like this. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He, He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Or else I will come and strike the land in total destruction. Malachi's is a book about judgment. It's about the fact that the priests in the land are leading the people astray. They're forgetting their duties. And instead of leading people towards good, they lead people towards harm. And this last promise is that God's going to send another kind of prophet in the spirit of Elijah. There's another kind of prophet that's going to help. But, and we actually sang it this morning, this line of this silent age of 400 years. That after this promise is spoken 400 years of silence. People stuck in a time of waiting, of pain and hardship, even judgment when other people from other lands came and pulled God's people away from their land because they weren't obeying. People stuck in sin and silence waiting. And in Luke, where we meet this man named Zechariah, a priest, he's part of this system in the temple. It's part of the system where every week the people of God would come and offer sacrifices to atone for their sin. I've wronged my neighbor. I've wronged my friend. And they would offer these sacrifices daily, a morning and the evening sacrifices. You can see pictures of the temple if it helps you to visualize that they would go in and out. You can even see an altar where burnt offerings were offered on the side over here. And they would go in and out. And if you're going to have people doing that, you have to have people to facilitate that. So priests, you had a whole tribe of priests who were facilitating this. And Zechariah is one of them. He's part of this whole system. But as you start to think about the man, Zechariah, you have to think about him as a priest who he's doing this every single day, going in and out, sacrificing, you know, whatever is brought to the table on behalf of the people. It almost starts to feel futile. What sacrifice will come at some point in time that's actually going to bring an end of all this? This system is not tenable. This system can't last forever. What is going to bring an end to this? And it's not just the man, Zechariah, who's a priest who serves faithfully, but it's, it's the man, it's the husband, Zechariah. Because not only has he prayed for the people, but he's also been praying because his wife has never been able to bear a child. They've never been able to become parents. And they're not young, they're old. And so they're, they're, there's this stuck, they're stuck in this sense of praying and crying out to God and not hearing much in return. But what we know about Zechariah and Elizabeth, it tells us this in verse 6. It says that Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were righteous in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. So Zechariah, priest before God, and what's unique about this is that he's part of this whole group of priests, and his name is drawn by lots to enter into the holiest of holies. He has his everyday stuff he does, but now... 
His group, it's his group's turn to be part of the holiest of holiest thing where a priest would enter in and offer, burn incense in the holiest of holies. This is the most sacred place for him. And not only this, it's probably his only time in his entire life that he is ever going to get to do this as a priest. This is one of the most significant times and moments in his entire life that he is going to be able to enter in to this holiest of holies place. So he's going to enter in and all the other priests, maybe a group of about five or six priests stay outside praying for him because something bad might happen to him. If he's, not, he's not properly atoned for his own sin. And I just think as he's entering into this place, how many of the times he's thought about when he went home, just blood soaked on his hands, the smell of blood on his clothes, maybe incense in his beard. He's asking that question I've already asked. What will it take for all of this to end? What will it take for all of this to end? Incredibly, what the, what the story shows us in Luke 1 is that he goes in the holiest of holies and an angel of the Lord meets him. A messenger from God meets him. And this is what it says in verse 13. The angel said to him, but do not be afraid. I always love it. The angel said, do not be afraid because they're terrifying. But angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth. So I imagine he was wondering, what prayer are you talking about? That prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. His prayer has been heard. I, I, I can, I mean, I just think about all the prayers you've answered in your life and you've never quite known how God heard them or how God's responding to them. And then he gets an angel to come to him. To say, we heard you. Your prayer has been heard. You're going to, your wife is going to bear a child. That's amazing. And then to break down what the angel says, I've kind of broken down for you so you can see. The angel tells Zechariah some very important things. He says, his name will be John. Got it. Check. That's probably important to remember. He will bring joy. So this is a child that will bring joy to Zechariah and Elizabeth. And he will walk the Nazarite way. So he starts describing no fermented drink and a couple other things. And he also says this. I mean, imagine if an angel came and told you, this about your child. He will be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and will lead people back to God. Verse 17, Gabriel says this, that's the name of the angel. He will go on before the Lord and the spirit and power of Elijah, remember Malachi, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, Zach, what we know about Zechariah, what I already said, is that he is righteous in character. He believed in the story. Sometimes we struggle with the story God's received us, I think. But Zechariah, the way Luke reads and presents Zechariah to us, he, he believes in the story. He's been walking in the story. But even though he is doing so well on that path, he gets to this moment where an angel comes before him, incredible, confirming the story and telling Zechariah, how he's going to respond to his prayer, and he has a moment of doubt. His reaction is not to say, yes! His reaction is to say, how can this be? Are you, how sure are you of this? Do you realize how old I am? Not to mention that my wife is not young either. Like, how in the world is this going to be? And I, at first, when we read the Bible, I think, man, we're not supposed to have any doubt following Jesus? No, I, I, I think we see very human characters in scripture and I, we are very human ourselves. And that I think all of us have had times when we've been tempted to question and doubt, caught up wondering, God, are you out there? Are you really doing this? We prayed for Israel and Palestine. God, do you see this pain? Come Lord Jesus, come. But in this moment, Zechariah who served his whole life for people, directing them towards God, he questions what God's doing. Let's just put it this way. The angel's response is not soft. He says this in verse 19, I am Gabriel. 
Gabriel, which I have a son named Gabriel. There's a few other Gabriels in this church. It means the Lord is my warrior. The Lord is my strength. There is a ferocity to this name. And also what we know about the angel Gabriel and other places of scripture. I am Gabriel. Check my Check my references. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you. And I tell you this good news. And now you will be silent. Not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. You kind of missed the boat on that one. So then immediately what happens with Zechariah is he loses his ability to speak. He comes out of the temple. He survived the holiest of holies, but he can't speak. And what's very clear to everyone around him is he's seen some kind of a vision. But now he has to live into the vision without being able to speak to it at all. So it's already been referenced in the service. A few people have been struggling with sickness and health. I started losing my voice this week. It's feeling okay right now. That's good. But the, the truth is that Losing my voice, I couldn't help but feel this kind of prophetic irony a little bit of like, I'm losing my voice, trying to talk about Zechariah, who's lost his voice. It's a lot. I even had a little sign up that I was like waving, which you can see is losing my voice, trying to speak with my hands and my eyes, you know, just trying. Because I really tried to practice a lot more silence this week. I did days of vocal rest. I was trying to parent at home with sign language. It was not going well. I was trying to, you know, we, we had multiple, we had, a, we had a Christmas party here. We had, we had people over at our house. I was trying, but it couldn't have been more inconvenient. But this whole week, what it helped for me to do, and it's kind of some of the space I'm still in this morning, is that silence, it really asked me this question. Like, what do you, you, you silence makes you ask, God, what do you want to say? So many people are rushing and rushing around, and I feel like the silence, it caused me to stop, and I hope it can for you today. God, what do you want to say? You know, am I willing to wait in the silence and wait for Christ to come in the midst of, yeah, my voice getting better, but for all the aches and pains and agonies I feel in my own personal life and in the life of our church and in the world, am I willing to wait in the silence for God who has promised to come, who said he would come? You know, we're not better than anyone else who preceded us. You think about all the people who lived and died in that 400 years of silence. Are we really that different? Outside of knowing more about who Jesus is, knowing more about the king he is, the kind of king he is, are we really that different that we don't think we deserve to wait? God, in this moment through Zechariah's story, he's saying, be quiet. Be still, watch. Zechariah, he goes home. He goes to be with his wife. And before you know it, Elizabeth is expecting a child. It's amazing. But her response is different. Her response, if you look at it, you can see it in verse 24. It says, her response is that she immediately sees it as God's favor. Where Zechariah challenged and questioned what God was doing or his ability to do it, Elizabeth receives it with open hands. She says, God has shown us favor. He's heard us. He, she immediately gives God the credit. What's your story of silence? I, it's really an analogy for just how we experience life. And there are these wilderness times, these times of darkness, these times of quiet, where everything just, we lose sense of control. And I, as someone who I, I've realized I, 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 I always thought of myself as a good listener, but the past couple of days trying to, trying to not speak and to listen is really hard. That I want to just speak a bunch of words. I want to say something that's going to help a relationship or say something that's going to fix a problem. And it's a very different thing to say, I think I'm called to wait in the silence. I'm called to be present. I'm not going to fix this by whatever I say, but God's calling me to be present and to watch him and welcome what he's doing. There's a, a devotion I've been reading this Advent season. Called, it's, it's by an author named Russ Ramsey. He's a pastor. And it says this about Zechariah's story. It was bittersweet, but this silence is a gift. 
Zechariah was given time to think, time to remember the words, the physical frame of the guardian of heaven whose apparition for some reason was easier to accept than the words he spoke. To worship God is to dwell on who he is, to consider his handiwork. And so how I want us to shift towards thinking, how do I take the good news of what's happening in this particular story in Zechariah's life, Elizabeth's life? I want to ask some questions that are connected to this idea. Silence is God's gift to prepare our hearts for Christ. Christmas is next week. I know it snuck up. But when you look at what is happening in the story, we step in and follow through. We are trying to prepare our hearts every year to welcome Christ into our hearts, whether it's for the first time or the 50th time to welcome Christ in our hearts because the Advent season is a time of hope and anticipation to prepare to receive. And so we've been using this language in our series and it's behold and become. So if we behold Christ on this journey of waiting for his coming, this is my first thing about silence. Silence stirs us towards listening and reflecting. I not, you know, I, I think about Zechariah. He wasn't able to even whisper to the child growing up in, in Elizabeth's womb. He wasn't able to speak or describe what he experienced. But then immediately he was put into this other place, this place of listening and reflecting on who God is and, and who God was calling Zechariah to become in the midst of this time. C.S. Lewis has this quote. It says, We live, in fact, in a world starved for solitude, silence, and private, and therefore starved for meditation and true friendship. Like to really contemplate on the things that matter in life most. Like sometimes we speak, or I, can, I catch myself speaking so much. I mean, we record videos almost every week. Jason laughs at me because I just, I just, it takes nothing for me to go really long in a video. And yeah, maybe I have things to say. Maybe you have things to say. But there is an important place in our hearts for us to be willing to receive, to listen, and to reflect. Because everything comes back to a relationship with God. I think about, you know, the rising concerns of mental health, of a more anxious world we know today, of a more anxious world we know today. And all of that, any kind of pain, any kind of hardship, what it comes from is disconnection from God. That we in some way are become disconnected from God. And the further and further we get from God, the more anxious we are, the more depressed we are, the more reactive, angry, rage-filled we are. And so the antidote is, what does it look like to embrace connection with God? It is through listening and reflecting. It is through looking at the story and seeing, this is for me. How do I get this for me? Maybe I don't think super hard, a lot with my head. Maybe I'm more of a heart person, or maybe I'm simpler by nature, but the principle still applies that I am trying to listen and to reflect, to notice and remember the story God has told me. I need to remember who God is in this world today. And God only gives this gift to Zechariah. I, I like to think about this. He only gives this gift to Zechariah because of the good things that God's already doing in his story. It isn't like, a, and I, I don't think really feel like this is used in parenting circles anymore, that children are best seen, not heard. Have you heard that message? Like, this isn't that. Throughout all of history, God's heard his people. He responded to the cries and lament of his people. He's heard them. The problem is that if all we're doing is crying out or complaining, then we as children are not listening. We miss out on what God's doing and what he intends to do in all time and today. It's not listening for content, for the right answer. Maybe sometimes you're in a conversation with someone and they're just, they're just listening to you so they know exactly what to say in response. But they're li it's listening for connection. Listening for connection, for a way to deepen love in a present moment. It, and it's part of a slowed down life. If you're so hurried, you will not be able to practice this. But I think God's grace, if you're beholding Christ and the story that Christmas welcomes us to, this is possible. That when the silence comes, this pause, this waiting, you can listen and reflect in a different kind of way. 
Here's my second point. If we behold Christ and wait for his coming, silence shows us what we need to say and do. The problem is, And Zechariah gets caught up in this, in this moment of being confused with an angel, not knowing what to do. He questions the angel is that sometimes, and I included in this, will say words that are not what I need to say. And I might do things that I didn't actually need to do. The real question is not whether to speak or to act, but to act and do exactly what God's called us to do, to say what God's called us to say. It's about priorities. It's the fact that your life matters just as well as anyone else's. And so when you go home today and you go out on this week and you avoid craziness at the stores, because I went to Costco yesterday, it was crazy. But if you avoid those things, like you're going to come up with the things you need to do and you need the capacity to do them well. You need the capacity to say them well. And it looks like worship. Like to, to acknowledge and reflect on who God is, we need the space to do this in worship. So that's words that I use, like gratitude. How do I speak and live and act in a way toward, that expresses gratitude? How do I even confess? We've done some of that this morning in worship. How do I operate from a place of, I need to acknowledge. Whenever I do silence, and I often do that uh, in morning times, spending time with the Lord in prayer, and like, like I did today or many other days, and immediately, if I give myself that amount of silence, I will come up with a lot of people I want to say sorry to. <laughs> I will come up to, I, I will have a lot of things that will start building of things stirring from my heart, just wanting to confess before God. When you, when you actually give yourself time, you figure out the things you need to say and not just words you could say. You figure out things you need to do and not just things you could do. The way Paul talks about lament, because lament is also something I think we need to do. I felt like when we were praying for Palestine and Israel this morning, that's what my heart was doing. I was lamenting. I was crying out, God, this isn't good. Have mercy. That was the thing that God pointed in my mind what was important today, that we prayed about that together. But lament, it's anchored in the promises of hope and provision of God. You have to know the story and live into the story and act in the story. You're not apart from the story. You're not living your own story somewhere off. God's welcomed you into his story. Before I share the last point, I want to finish what happens with Zechariah and Elizabeth, right? Because he goes home and there's also a weird detail where Elizabeth is in seclusion for five months. Ladies, I don't know what that was like. Five months of seclusion? That does not make sense. But either way, there's this time of waiting that's initiated, connected to the pregnancy of a child that would one day name John. And so the baby arrives, and you see this joyous arrival of a baby. Zechariah is still not speaking at this point, by the way. And all the people, they're trying to decide what he's going to call. He's about to be circumcised. And they ask Elizabeth, what do you want to call him? And, And she says, John. Now, the, nobody in Zechariah's family is named John. So culturally, they're like, but that's not what you do. You name someone based upon someone in the family. That's not what you do. So they start pushing back, and they finally ask Zechariah, who's still mute, and he pulls out his tablet, which I'm guessing he's used more than once, and he says his name is John. And he immediately starts to speak. After all this time, the silence is breaking as he's believing and trusting in the story that God's welcomed him to participate in. This story that is a song that it's going to change the way we tell stories from here on out. It's almost like what First Peter talks about, that he's filled with this inexpressible, glorious joy. And so the last point is this. If you behold Christ and wait for him, silence breaks with the sound of joy. That if you trust God in the midst of the silence, whatever it is, you're waiting for the next season of life to cue in. God, this is taking a little bit. The job, school, what your personal life looks like, marriage, family life, whatever it is, we enter into the silence at all different kinds of points in time. And the question is, do we trust God? Are we willing to wait? And if we trust him with the silence, the silence does lead to a song of joy. 
Because it's not only do we see all the ways that Christ has come for us, but Christ will come again. And that joy meets us in this present moment. We're not disconnected from the past or the future. It's brought into the present. And this is what Zechariah's response is. He immediately starts to speak. He names John, which means grace. And so he's trying to say in every way, acknowledging God's story over him, God is gracious. And then he erupts into a song. Zechariah's song is beautiful. It's just like Mary's Magnificat. And the first word out of his mouth as part of this song in verse 68 says this, praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. In this whole song, I won't go verse by verse, but you should read it later. He reaches back into the old, old story, the word of the prophets, the ancestors, the, to Abraham, to the very character of God. And then he's all looking at his new son, his new son and saying, this child will be the forerunner of God's grace in the world. The everlasting king coming to reign. He reaches back into the old, old story. And what's clear is that the story is not leading to John, but to someone else. And he ends the song by saying this, pointing to another person who will come in verse 78, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. God's coming mercy will come to guide people to light. And God's coming mercy will be in the form of a child, the form of his savior king, who will light up in a world of darkness, offer life uh, for people in the shadow of despair, peace for people in the midst of pain. This is the song that breaks the silence. One of the commentators I read this week said this, What God is doing extends the reach of what God has done. It exceeds what had been hoped. And the result will be a new community with God's peace and justice incarnated in us. So look at these three things here. If you behold Christ and wait for his coming, silence can stir you towards listening and reflecting. Silence can also show you what you need to say and do. And also silence can break forth with joy, the sound of joy. I'd like to invite our worship team to come up because what this leaves is a challenge. It's a challenge. As you look at the week before Christmas, how am I going to do this? I've got work. I've got six Christmas parties, sometimes two times a day. And I've got my family and people I feel estranged from or close to. It's so much Carve out time for silence. Maybe switch off the stereo. Maybe try to listen more than speak. Maybe try to watch and observe rather than act. And in every way, try to create space for silence. So you also are creating space, not for burst of happiness. Oh, we get to do this. No, do that so you can participate in the everlasting joy and the everlasting song. Because every song we sing is part of a larger story. And I know because of God's love for you, he's welcoming you to be part of that story and not be caught up in all the ways the silence leads you apart from God, but instead to embrace silence that is with him. So please uh, join me in praying as we just ask God to lead us in worship and response. Lord, there's, a, there's good reason for why silence could be horrifying for us. Not all of us know what it's like to hear your voice. A lot of us know what it's like to be in pain or to be frustrated or anxious. And to even just to feel alone. But this moment, Lord, where we see Zechariah and we see Elizabeth and we see them receiving their newborn child, John, and we realize The old stories are true, not just for them, but for me. And Lord, I pray that you help each person who are feeling so alone, feeling like you are silent, that you would speak in your mercy and love, whether it's through the story, whether it's through any song we would sing, whether it's through the comfort of your Holy Spirit. 
that you and your mercy would guide us to the path of light and hope and joy. And if anyone's wondering who you are and what the story is leading to, I pray that we would be a, we would be a place that could tell the story well, that could embody the story and live it out well, because it is a good story. A story that talks about a child being born unto us, that we would become who we were always meant to be. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.